Jesus, so we worship you, God. Jesus, we magnify your name, Lord. Lord, there's no one else like you, God. Lord, you're the beginning and the end, Father God. You're the Alpha and the Omega, Lord. You are all powerful, Lord Jesus. That's why we worship you today, God. Lord, you are our refuge. You are our strength, God. Lord, you are great, Lord. You are awesome, God. You are mighty, Lord Jesus. Lord, there is no one like you, God, on this earth, Lord. And we lift our voices to you, God. To you, Lord, because you are the one that gives us life, Lord. You are the one that sets us free, God. You are the one that delivers us, God. Lord, you are the one that gives us strength when we are weak, Lord. You are the one who loves us when we don't have any love around us, Father God. You are the one who accepts us when nobody else accepts us, Father God. Lord, and we just want to thank you tonight, God, for who you are, Lord. For who you are and what you've done. And what are you going to continue doing tonight, Lord. And for the rest of our lives, Father God. For you are the God who was. You are the God who is. You are the God who is going to be. In the name of Jesus, God, we magnify your name, Lord Jesus. And we declare, Father God, that you are great, that you are mighty, and you are awesome, God. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And oh, see how great, and how great is our God. The splendor of the King, the splendor of the King, clothed in majesty. Rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice.
it from your heart. Come on. It says, my heart will sing how great. Sing that, Jonathan. And my heart will sing. And my heart will sing. Come on. I want you to sing from your heart. Not from your mind, from your heart. He's great. Come on. Sing that. Sing it. My yeah. heart will sing. Oh, hallelujah. You're my the heart name, will sing. Lord. And you're the name. From your hearts, and my heart will sing, and in my heart will sing. Come on, my heart will sing. My heart will sing. My heart, my heart, my heart will sing. In my heart will sing. Yes, my heart will sing, and my heart will sing. My heart, my heart.
is our God. I just feel like the Lord was talking to Amanda just a second ago, and I feel like the Lord right now is healing things because you're not focused on your issue, you're focused on Jesus. And so many times we get wrapped up in all of our problems and circumstances and we focus so much on those things and they consume us. And that's why worship is so important that you just forget about those things and focus on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so when, I, when we ask you to lift your hands and we ask you to clap and we ask you to set your affections and your attention upon Him, it's because you become what you behold. And if you're wanting to learn how to be clean and live holy, you got to start looking into His face. And as, you peer, and as you pierce through that second heaven, as you look past, that, past your mind and that veil in your mind, you begin to see someone that is holy, someone that is righteous, and you begin to see. The Bible says, look up unto the hills from which cometh your help. Your help comes from the Lord. And when you begin to set your eyes upon things that are above and not those things that are beneath, those things that are around you, you begin to find out that He is the source. He's the answer. He's the way to make yourself clean. So Holy Spirit, we just set our affections upon you right now. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, come on. Let's just set our affections on the Holy Spirit. Nothing else matters but you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> Nothing else matters but you, Holy Spirit. All the cares of today, they're gone because we're in the presence of the Holy Spirit, in the presence of a holy God. Oh, hallelujah. Come on. Let's just worship. Holy, 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 holy. The one who was and is and is to come. Holy. Holy, holy. Come on. The Lord God Almighty. The Lord God Almighty. Hallelujah. Come on, lift up your voice. He enjoys it. He enjoys your worship. Come on, He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, we're not going past this moment. Come on, we're not rushing anything. Come on, open up your heart. Open up your heart to Him. Open up your heart. Come on, let Him into the deep places. Let Him into the deep places of your heart. Let him know you love him. Come on, let, let him know you love him. Come on, from your heart. From your heart. From your heart. Come on, talk from your heart. Not from your mind, from your heart. Come on, talk from it. Tell him. Tell him what he means to you. Come on, tell him, tell him how much you need him, how much you love him. We need you, Jesus. We want you here. We want you here, Jesus. We want your presence, your glory. We want it to fill this place. Oh, Lord, we want your presence above anything else. We want your presence. More than good music and sermons, God, we want your presence. More than relationships, more than anything, God, that this world could give us, we want your presence. 
Oh, hallelujah. We want your presence. Come on. Some of you need to fall in love with him again. You get caught up in traditions and formalization. We need to get in to falling in love with him again. Come on, press in right there. I see some of you just getting it right now. The Holy Spirit's just breaking through. He's breaking up that hard heart. Come on, we got to go further in this thing. We got to go further in this thing. He's wanting to break somebody open, break that hard heart of stone, and replace it with the heart of flesh. Oh, Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. Beyond what we think or, or what we can imagine, God, do beyond what we can think, or ask or think. Do beyond exceeding abundantly above all. Holy Spirit, do what you want heal broken hearts. I speak healing to broken hearts right now. I speak healing to broken hearts right now. I speak joy to those that, uh, that are suffering with depression right now. I speak the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is your strength. I speak strength into your body right now. Come on, just open up your spirit and receive the word of the Lord. I just speak joy right now to those that, that, that are suffering with depression and heaviness. I speak joy. I speak strength right now in the name of Jesus. I speak peace to a weary mind right now. Oh, come on. Some of you got to cast your care upon him. Take those cares and just cast it to him. Just give it to him. Lay it at his feet. Cast your cares upon him. I speak peace to troubled and weary minds right now. Peace, the peace of God. The peace of God that passes all understanding. I speak that over you tonight in the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, I speak freedom over your life. No hindrances. No distractions. Oh, no more heavens that are brass. Open heavens over your life. Open heavens over your life to receive the fullness of God tonight. Oh, I speak to your heart to open up tonight. Open up in the name of Jesus and receive the word of the Lord. Receive the presence of a holy God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. the Lord touch you. You don't need anybody to lay hands on you. Just right there where you're at. Let the Lord heal your heart.
and all will see how great, how great is our God, how great is our God, sing with me. our God, oh, see how great, how great is our God. Come on, one more time, lift up your voice one more time. And how great is our God, sing with me. Our God, oh, we'll see how great. Come on, everybody stand on your feet, and I want you to give Jesus a hand clap of praise. Come on, I want you, everybody, stand on your feet. Come on, let's honor the King of Kings. Hallelujah! 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 Come on, don't stop. Hallelujah! You're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy. Come on, don't stop, don't stop. He's worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Hallelujah. Oh, don't stop. Come on, we're getting into something. We're getting into something. Let the heavens be open. Let the heavens be open. Come on. Hallelujah. Come on, let's break this thing open for our city right now. Let's break this thing open. Tonight can be the night. Come on, that everything changes. Come on. We worship you, God. We want you because of who you are. We want you because of who you are. We want you because of who you are. Oh, our hearts are burning for the living God. Our hearts are burning for the living God. Hallelujah. step into what you're doing. Oh God, we step into what you're doing right now. You're doing a new thing right now, God, and we step into it right now. God, like Ezekiel 47, we go ankle, then knee, then waist, and then we go over our heads. Lord, we want over our heads tonight. We go into, we trust you, we trust you. We throw ourselves into the deep. and We trust you. We trust you to establish truth in our lives. We trust you, God. To speak your word and rescue us from our situations, God. We trust in the blood of Jesus and the move of the Holy Spirit. You're the good shepherd. The good shepherd, God. We trust you tonight. We trust you tonight. Come on, how many of you love Jesus? Would you just let him know it? Come on. Just by putting your hands together and raising up your voice. You don't have to shout. I just want you to talk to him and tell him that you love him. We appreciate Come on. Come on, you can do better than that. Do something. Let him know. He's worthy. He's worthy. We don't have you clap your hands for hype. We have you clap your hands because he's worthy. Oh, hallelujah. Come on. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Jesus, Lamb of God. Oh, Lord. God Almighty. Hallelujah. 
come on, you can, if you don't mind, just move back to the center section here and begin to fill it up. And get your Bibles and things ready to get in the Word. You got to understand, every Tuesday night is going to be different. It's not going to be the same thing over and over again. It's going to be a new new thing. And the Holy Spirit comes in one night and it might be shouting and dancing and running. Then the other night it just might be worship, just strictly worship. And, and we may never preach. We may never say or do anything like that other than praise and worship. But tonight I feel like we've got something that I've got something to share with you. Last week we uh, went into redigging the wells of the authority of Scripture. And we talked about Martin Luther. And I realized some of you were in convocation and you missed and and, and we, un we understand that. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to hit a couple things there. Then I'm going to transition into the word tonight. But before we do that, I just want to, um, if, and Michael, if he'll get ready for the video, is it still good to go? The video? Um, if he will get that ready for the screens, I want to invite you. And if you're in Cleveland, this is a commandment. For you to get yourself to the con center Saturday from 9 to 9 for 12 hours of worship. And listen, the only rain I'm agreeing for in this city is Saturday. All this other stuff can go away, all right? I'm sick of this rain, but the rain, I'm, I'm partnering with you on rain on Saturday. But I, I just want to challenge you to get there in, in 12 hours of, of prayer and worship. And, and Michael, if you'll get that ready, I want to show you the video, and I just want to challenge you to get there on Saturday from 9 to 9. They heard a sound in Jesus' day, but they couldn't identify the sound. They missed it. They even heard the sound of John the Baptist. They heard the voice crying out, but they, they couldn't get it. You must hear the sound of the Spirit. You must hear the voice of God saying, come to me. You must hear him. You must hear the sound of heaven drawing you. You must hear the sound of his presence. You've got to get to that place where, where nothing matters but the voice, the sound. You must get there. It must drown out all else in your life. It must, all the cares, all of your other desires, all of your passions, everything else has to, has to be brought down to a level where the loudest thing you hear is his voice saying, come, come, come. you to be there. I just believe that this is semester we're going to see it. Oh, oh, yeah, I guess. No, this is the semester we're going to see it. Boy, I'm telling you, you're getting ready to get something tonight. I can just tell by that response you're about to get something tonight. I'm just going to let you know, yep, you're going to get something tonight. That response right there was I, I guarantee you that came from the reservoir of some deep faith. Oh, I'm thankful I'm not a pastor. I'm just a preacher. I'm just a voice in this city. And, and you don't have to like me at the end of the day. I got to speak the word of the Lord. So this lines up just right with what I'm going to talk about tonight. I want you to open up your Bibles to Luke 24. It's good to see everybody. Let me go ahead and get my good remarks out before we start <laughs> this message. No, I'm kidding. Tonight's message is actually going to be encouraging, but I always just let you know that I don't know which way it's going. Tonight I'm going to preach out in my spirit, and uh, I can't tell you what this thing sounds like. I've never heard this sermon before, so we will see where we go with this tonight. I'm excited about what God's doing in Cleveland. I'm excited about what God's doing in my life. I'm excited about what God's doing in Cleveland, and I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad that uh, you're going to be a part of it, and we're going to see it in our day. We don't going to have to wait a bunch of years, and, and uh, we, we don't have to spend, listen, I'm, I'm telling you, we don't have to spend hours and hours in prayer. It's here. 
But the problem is we've got to have faith to partner with the word spoken over this city. And I've talked about this many, 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 many times. And uh, I'm going to dig into this thing again. Last week, we dug into this, this well called the authority of the scripture. And I talked a little bit about Martin Luther and how that, that Martin Luther, he was hated because he challenged the political system of his day. And, and he came against those that were using the Bible and religion for profit. And, uh, and that's P-R-O-F-I-T, not P-R-O-P-H-E-T. It's profit. And they were trying to make money off of it. And they made it this elitist machine. Um, and, and, and he just challenged that whole system. And he made people realize that they were not saved because they came to a man. They were saved because they came to the cross. And he began to identify uh, with the people. And he said, listen, these people, and he even says it in some, when you study his life, that, that he even talked about that people can set in services during his day. And for years and years, they could go to church and never understand one thing that happened in service. And so what he did is, that, and they began to hate him, and they began to ridicule him, so much so that they wanted to kill him. So in fear for his life, his friends kidnapped him and took him and hid him away. And while he was hidden, he translated the Scripture. And, and, and then the story really begins to unfold. Once he translates the Scriptures into German, then the, then the average Joe can have the Scriptures. And they said, and history tells us, that when the ordinary people got the Word of God where they could understand that the Reformation could not be stopped. That's powerful. The Reformation had started when... God put the burden on one man named Martin Luther. Reformation is not when we get a bunch of people together and start changing things. Reformation first starts here in the heart. And Martin Luther began to let God deal with him and he began to challenge the system and then it led to the translation and the Reformation couldn't be stopped when the Word of God got involved. And then I talked about the power of the Word and the Word being the covering of your life. And uh, we talked about Proverbs 29, 18, and I, I broke the Scripture down. And I want to share it with you, those of you, and just hit it real quick. If you've got pen and paper, I want you to put this down, and you need to study it out yourself. But the Proverbs 29, 18, where it says, Where there's no vision, the people perish. And I'm just recapping last week so we can connect it with this week. But the, the Bible says if you look at, up the, the meaning of the word vision, it, me, it actually means where there is no divine communication, the people perish. So, and then you look up the word perish, and that actually translates naked. So where there's no divine communication, the people are naked. And so I begin to ask the Lord, what does this mean? And he told me, he said, Mark, he said, it's, the, it's what happened in the garden when Adam and Eve fell. He said, when Adam and Eve fell, what do people say they do? They lost, they broke fellowship with God. And so when they broke fellowship with God, they got cut off from divine communication. And what the Bible say, they began, they were naked and ashamed. Lisa, did you dye your hair purple? What is that on your head? It freaked me out. I thought she dyed her hair purple. Sorry, I got distracted. Whew. I mean, I mean, anybody else got purple hair, I'm good with that. I was just like, wow. Um, but anyways, where there's no divine communication, the people are naked. And what the Lord began to show me is when Adam and Eve fell, they got cut off from divine communication. And then what happened is the Bible says, and they were naked and ashamed. So immediately God institutes a plan for their nakedness. And what's He do? He kills the lamb, and then He takes the lamb's skin and He covers their nakedness. And so what the Holy Spirit said to me is, how do I get my people back in the glory? they got to put on the Lamb. And that's what we talked about last week, and that's what you've got to live by, is you got to learn how to put on the Lamb. When you come up against a situation where you don't know how to handle, you got to get in the Word and understand how to put on the Lamb. And so putting on the Lamb is salvation. Romans 13, 14 says, Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so he's saying... Put on the Lamb of God. And that Lamb is the Word. And we know that. And I'm not going to break all that down. But you study that out. But you got to learn how to put on the Lamb. But then, this week, I planned on going ahead about 200 years. And we were going to talk about the Moravians. Which the Moravians, we all know, were intercessors. They were prayer warriors. They started one of the, the, um, the strongest missions. Because they started a prayer movement. And they said, no one works unless someone prays. 
And they, they got up in the prayer tower and they started a prayer movement 24-7 for 100 years. Wow. And so they got in this lifestyle of prayer. And, soon as, and I, I think it's interesting that when they get into a lifestyle of prayer, they automatically st start into a life of missions. And I think a lot of us, the reason why we're not sent is because we don't pray. All right, you can have that one for free. I'm not going to get in that because that, that's a whole other thing. I wish I had that organ tonight. Glory to God. So I begin to pray. And, I, and, and for some reason, I couldn't get away from this word. I couldn't get away from this well because I felt like the Holy Spirit said, we're not ready yet. And see, if you don't know, if you've never been here, what we want to do on Tuesday nights is we want to equip an end time army. We want to get you ready for what God's about to do. And I tell people all the time, the worst thing that could happen in this city is for revival to come and we not be ready for it. And that's why we're here on Tuesday nights because we want to get people ready for the move of God because it's not good enough for it to come and not be sustained. And if revival's going to come in this city, my job is I've got to get you ready so that you can accommodate it. And so tonight, we're just going to plow into this thing again because God shared with me. He said, there are some people that took your message on Tuesday and the, re and the way they will use that is they will use it for behavior modification and they won't actually allow it to change their heart. So I showed you how to put on the lamb. But, but we all know, we've all heard this saying, a wolf can put on lamb's clothing for, for a little while. So I don't want you to be able to learn how to put on the lamb without having your heart changed. And that's what I want to talk about tonight is your heart and, and, and the word, how the word of God and prayer affects your heart. And I want to kind of get into the dealings of the heart. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to the most impossible situation in a follower's life. A, a, something that you and I will never face. An impossibility that some of you and I will never experience. And in Luke 24, Jesus had already been taken to the cross. He had already died. They had already put Him in the tomb. And now we're at a place where Mary comes to the tomb and the stones rolled away and nobody's in there. And she goes back and tells the disciples what had happened. And guess what? These men that walked with, the, with Jesus, the Son of the living God, for three and a half years, now are in a state of unbelief. After hearing, after hearing His words, after seeing the miracles, after being in all the services, after watching Him feed the 5,000, after watching Him open up blinded eyes and deaf ears and raise the dead Himself, and now they're at a place of unbelief. Which totally explains why our generation that have, been, have grown up in church can go to every service, can go to Winterfest, can go to youth retreats, you can go to youth camp, and you still sit there not being able to believe what the Word of God says. You can see miracle after miracle, and you can see all these things and go to every prayer meeting and every church service and still have a heart that's not burning. Because some people, let's just face it, like Christianity because they feel it's just the right thing to do. I'm here to tell you it's the only thing to do. Hmm. Holy Spirit, I pray for your anointing and I pray for your grace on this word. Come on, some of the intercessors, you just begin to pray. And I pray for an anointing that will destroy every yoke of bondage of unbelief and doubt in the name of Jesus. And I pray for this word to go forth like a sharp two-edged sword. Your word is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And I pray for you to go deep, Holy Spirit. I pray for you to go deep inside the hearts of all of these men and women that are in this room. And God, I ask that you accelerate their maturity so they'll be able to handle what you're about to do. Because God, I just believe you're about to pour out your spirit on this city like what's been prophesied for hundreds of years, God. The prayers that have been prayed, they're getting full. The bowls are getting full and you're about to pour it out, God. And I pray for our hearts to be ready to receive. I pray for our hearts to be ready to receive. And here we are. They had seen the miracles. They had heard the word. And now they're in the most impossible situation of their life. They had watched Jesus, the Son of the living God, die a, die a horrible death. And I want, to sh I want you to just see the hearts of a believer. Now, this, this message is not even for the unsaved. This message is for the believer. And I want to show you how the heart is 
And what this message is, it's going to be an encouragement. For some, it's going to be a rebuke. But for some, it's going to be an encouragement. Because some of you are in this place right now, and I really want to come against unbelief tonight. And I want to come against doubt. I want to come against the, uh, the feeling of disappointment while you're seeking after God and seeking after revival. Because you've got to move beyond just knowing the Scripture. You've got to move beyond knowing the God of the Scripture. We've got to get into this place where the Bible becomes more than just another book. Because I've read books that have changed my life because they change the way I think. But if we knew the God of the Word, not only does it change our, our minds, but it changes our hearts. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. Let's, I'm going to kind of skip through. I'm going to read a couple verses. And then, and I'm, like I said, I'm going to skip around. And we all have read this, I'm sure, Luke 24 and verse 13. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score, three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together in reason, Jesus Himself drew near and went with them. Now, these two men are followers of Jesus. They were followers. They are some, and they were beginning to talk about the things that had happened. And they were reasoning together. Now I want to take you into this place. You've got to put yourself in this place. They are in a place of impossibility. We talked about how Isaac sowed in the middle of a famine. That's impossible to get a harvest in the middle of a famine. But when you have a word from God and you partner with that word, you can reap results in times of impossibilities. But watch how the Holy Spirit words this and how He takes us through this. They're in a place of impossibility and now they're walking together talking about the things that are going on in the city. Two guys walking. Greg, get up here and walk with me a little bit. And they're, and I'm not going to push on you. I'm not going to karate chop you or anything. You just take it easy. I, I pulled Greg up one time in a church service and I wrestled him. I was talking about Jacob and, and uh, I took it easy on him. I didn't put him in the floor or anything like that. But um, So put your guard down. We're just going to walk. And they're walking together. And it would be just like Greg and I talking about the city. And I wanted to put this in perspective because the impossible situation in Cleveland is everybody talks about revival, but they don't believe it's coming. And these disciples were facing an impossibility. Their Savior, the one they had been following for three and a half years, is dead and they don't know where He's at. And so they're walking and they're saying, can't you believe what happened? Did you see what they did to Jesus? He was a good man. He was a good man, Greg. You saw the miracles that he did. You heard the words that he preached. You heard all those things. What in the world has happened? Where is he at? Where did they lay him? Now let's translate it today. Greg, you heard about that prayer meeting. I wonder what happened to those people. I wonder why that house church faded away. I wonder why, I wonder why that prayer meeting faded away. I can't understand it. I thought there was a move of God there. And people moved away and people came and they went. What happened? What happened, Greg? What happened? I thought we were on to something. I, I, we were in those services. We were in those prayer meetings where they went for hours and hours. And we were in those prayer meetings where the fire of God came. And we just knew at any moment that revival was going to break out. But it didn't happen, Greg. What happened? Think about it. Think about it. They were facing an impossible situation. They were facing this situation where how in the world this man that we had seen raise the dead, how in the world, now he's dead and he's gone and we don't even believe in what he did. Watch this, Greg, you sit down. Just walking and talking and reasoning together, trying to figure everything out. They're walking and they're talking and they're trying to figure out what in the world happened. Now watch this. You would think that they were upset because he was their, because he, he was their leader. You would think they were upset because of who he, he was. But I'm about to show you how the heart is so deceiving. Let me show you how the heart is so deceiving. They were communing together and reasoning together and Jesus drew near and went with them, but their eyes were holding that they should not know Him. And He said unto them, What manner of communication are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? Notice what questions. The Holy Spirit just doesn't inspire the writer in, this, in these Scriptures to just put this question down for no reason. He put that in there to ask. He said, what manner of conversation is this in the middle of an impossible situation? I want to know why are you talking like this? He's getting to something. He's challenging the heart of those two men that were followers of Him. Now He's walking with them and they don't even know it's Him. 
And he said, what manner of conversation is this that you are talking and you're sad? What kind of talk is this? Did, and basically what, what I translate it is he's saying, haven't I taught you better than this? Did you not see all the impossible situations that we faced in three and a half years? And every time God came through. And Jesus is now looking at these disciples and he said, what manner of conversation is this? And that's what I want to challenge you tonight. Some of you have been to Lee. Some of you have been praying for Cleveland. Some of you have been at Lee for, for a while. Some of you have been praying over Cleveland. Some of you have been here two years. Some of you have been four years. Some of you have been living here a lot longer. And you've been talking. And everybody's talking about revival. And everybody's talking about the things to come. And we've been in the services where people just get flung in the floor. People go into visitations. And then it seems like nothing breaks through. What happened? You know what I feel like Jesus is saying? In the middle of this spiritual famine, every t- it feels like every time we take two steps forward, we take three steps back in this city. Every time we have a good service, it's like we have to wait a month or two before we hit another good service again to break through again. We take two steps forward and three steps back. And I just feel like the Lord's saying, what manner of conversation is this? When you call this city a religious city, you ought to be calling it a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. What manner of conversation is this? You're talking about how religious this city. You should be moving in faith. And faith calleth those things that are not as though they were. And Jesus asked these men in the middle of an impossible situation where they were covered in unbelief. He asked them one question. What manner of conversation is this? What about at your home? Those people that, that, that you have already wrote them off. You said, there's no use for me to even witness to them. There's no use for me to even tell them or invite them to church or invite them to something that's going on, an activity that I'm participating in my church. Why even invite that friend from Lee University? Why even bring that family member to this event? Why even do it? And Jesus comes to you tonight and he says, what manner of conversation is this? And look what they say. They said, are you a stranger? Have you not been in this city? Don't you see the condition where we're at? We've been following this man for three and a half years. And all of a sudden now it's over. We've been following this man who did miracles. And you read the scriptures. I'm not going to read all of it. I'm just going to paraphrase. And they said, and, and, he said, and Jesus looks at him and says, well, what things have happened? He asked him again. He, he's getting to the heart of the matter. He's asking questions not because he doesn't know. He's the Son of God. He's asking questions to get to the real issue of the heart. And he looks at him and, and, and they say, Don't you know? Aren't you a stranger? Haven't you seen what's going on? Haven't you heard? Where are you from? And he said, Tell me, what things? And they said this. Now watch how the heart is. They said this. Jesus the prophet. He was a prophet. They identified him as a prophet. And the Bible says that he had power. He was mighty in deed and word before God and all people. And now this man that had moved in power in word and deed, now the chief priests have taken him and they have crucified him. Don't you know what's going on? Now think about it. Think about what it would be like to follow somebody. Knowing that He's the Son of God. And that hope that's in you. I'm walking with the Son of God. And you're seeing Him open up blinded eyes and heal deaf ears. And, and, and making the mute to talk. And, 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 and He's talking. And crippled people are walking. And He's stopping funeral, the funeral procession. And He raises the bo- little boy back to life again. They had seen those things. And now it's over. Just like that. Three and a half years. Gone in a day. And they're saying, what in the world's going on? And they had told Jesus. said, Look, this is what happened. But watch this. Let me show you this. And and we're going to read this. Here's what Jesus was getting to. But we trusted, verse 21. But we trusted that it had been He which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. I did a little word study here. Keep that... Keep that scripture up there. That word redeemed there, I looked that up and I wanted to see if that meant salvation or what that meant. But it was actually an indication for a restoration of political power. Some of you are going to get this in a minute. They said he was a prophet. He did mighty things. But we trusted that he would do it the way we thought he should do it.
We trusted that he was going to take Israel and restore it as a superpower. We thought that he was going to rise up and that we were going to push back our enemies and we was going to take this land and we were going to take over the world. We thought he was the one that was going to set up that kingdom, that everlasting kingdom. And, and we thought all these things were going to happen, but now he's dead. And all that started with one misconception. And I talked about the first week, how many of you remember it? I talked about the misconception where they wanted to be like every other nation. They wanted to be like every other nation. They were governed by prophets, but they said, it's not good enough anymore, Samuel. You didn't raise your sons up in your ways. They don't judge like you would have. We want a king like other nations. And guess what God said? I'll give you what you want. And they got a king like all the other nations. And they got a king, and they recognized the king as somebody that had power, that, that, that was somebody that was, had all authority. He was somebody that had all the riches. He was the one that commanded everybody, and everybody served him. And that misconception came that they got Saul, a king like other nations. And what happened was, when the real king came, they couldn't identify him. Because he wasn't like all the other kings from other nations. He was coming as a servant, humble. Isn't that crazy that a, mis a misconception from a thousand years before had carried over until now and they were looking for the king that was going to restore and make things like, like Saul or David to be a, a superpower. And guess what? Now the king had come and gone and they couldn't identify him. They were upset. And they said, we trusted in this one thing said he was a prophet, yes, but we trusted that he was going to do it the way we wanted him to do it. Doesn't that sound like us? We get upset when he doesn't do it our way and we get in unbelief when he doesn't do it our way, when he doesn't do it in our timing, when he doesn't do it when we want it. What do we do? We get in doubt and unbelief and we just say, oh, forget it. And there's many people in this city that are not running after revival because they got disappointed. There's many people in this city that broke fellowship with a, with a community with burning hearts because they, they, they got disappointed. They disconnect. They said, you know what? I'm not going to dance like that anymore. I'm not, I'm not going to go to every prayer meeting every day. I'm not going to do that anymore. Because it didn't happen when we did it. Don't you understand, Mark? I gave my life to it. I went to every prayer meeting. I went to church services. I did all the things. I fasted. I prayed. I sought God. But it didn't happen the way I wanted. And some of you are in this room right now. And you're in that boat. And He didn't do, do it the way you wanted him to do it. And watch this. He finally gets to the heart of the matter. And he goes down. And he begins to talk to him. And then they begin to tell him. After they said he, they, they had trusted that he was going to redeem Israel. Then he looks at them. And, and, and they said, but... A woman came and told us that the tomb was empty. And we don't know where he's at. Watch what he says. He rebukes him. He said, oh fool. And slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Know what he was saying? Oh fool and slow of heart. Because you don't believe what the word of God says. Just because it didn't happen, it's not happening the way you want it, doesn't mean it's not happening. And just because it didn't happen in the time frame in which you thought it should happen doesn't mean it's not going to happen. I'm here to tell you, the prayers, are, the prayers and the bowls of prayer are getting full and God's about to pour it out on the city. And I've come here tonight to encourage you. Not to rebuke you and just say, oh, oh, full and slow of heart. I'm going to show you that the scriptures can turn this thing around. I'm going to show you tonight that prayer can turn this thing around. Jump, jump ahead. And it says, and beginning. Now watch this. He looks at him. He said, oh fool, slow of heart. In, to, to believe all the prophets had spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and entered into his glory? Now watch this. Verse 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You know what Jesus did? In the middle of an impossible situation, in the middle of the time where they couldn't believe and they didn't have the faith, they didn't know that what was going to happen in that situation, Jesus doesn't do anything else. He doesn't give them a crazy manifestation. He didn't even reveal Himself. He was walking with them and they didn't even know it. 
That sounds like us in possible situations. And we think God's not there and He's walking right beside of us. We get in these incredible, impossible situations and we think, oh, God's so far away and He's right there in our face. I'm telling you, I'm, I, at least I'm encouraged. Because I know what it's like to face these impossible situations. I know what it's like to have to stand up here on Tuesday nights and talk to a bunch of people that don't believe what I say. I know what it's like. I've been doing it for years. But I've come here tonight because God said He's going to change some hearts tonight. There's some of you in here, you've been having trouble believing it's because there's no consistency in prayer life and in the Word. And we're going to fix that tonight. We're going to fix that tonight. And He began with Moses. That meant He started in Genesis. And he went all the way through the prophets, all the way up into Malachi. Could you imagine what that conversation looked like? In Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman, that was me. When God told him to institute the Passover, that lamb, that was me. <laughs> I'm telling you, oh God, I feel it. I hope somebody will help me shout here in a minute. <laughs> he looked, he took him over into... Deuteronomy, he said, you know, when God spoke to Moses and said, I'm going to raise up a prophet like unto Moses, he's going to lead the people. That was me. <laughs> he went over into Isaiah and he said, you know that scripture where he says that he was wounded for his transgressions, bruised for your iniquities, and the chastisement of my peace was upon him. And by his stripes, you are healed. You know those stripes I took on my back three days ago? That, that was me. He didn't give him a crazy manifestation. He started pointing to the Word. In the middle of unbelief, He didn't give him a manifestation. He didn't send an angel down. He didn't send fire down from heaven. He went like this. Hey, wake up and look back at the Word. Because right now, the condition of your, of your heart, if an angel came down, you'd worship it and not God because your heart's not ready. God knows what He's doing. So I'm here to tell you in Cleveland, don't think this thing's going to look flaky. It's going to start with truth. It's not going to start with angels ascending and descending visibly to all of us. It's not going to happen that way. You're not going to see some crazy, wild thing. It's going to start right here. I'm telling you, this is the Word of God. I'm telling you, what, he, what He's speaking through me tonight. Will visions and dreams happen? Absolutely. I'm not saying they won't. But it's going to start when we start looking back here. Because what did he do in the most impossible situation? He started showing them where he was. And then, and then could you just imagine? He took him to Malachi and he said, And the son of righteousness rising up on healing, with healing in his wings. He said, that was me. Here they are. He started with Moses all the way up to Malachi. And he showed them. That was me. Watch this. <laughs> And, the, and so it got late. And the two men, they were walking. And the two men said, don't go, don't leave. Come in, break bread with us. And the Bible says that as they broke bread, that Jesus appeared to them. Listen, here's what I'm going to tell you. When we start looking here, that's when we're going to start seeing revelation. <laughs> Some of you in here are seeking for experience without first starting here. We're trying to jump ahead. God's not going to let somebody that's immature handle the precious things of His Spirit. It starts here. He's not going to pour out a miracle ministry through your life until you have established a relationship here. Don't expect to participate in what God's about to do if you haven't started here. Forget it. Because what God's going to do in Cleveland is going to be solid. That it's not going to have. There's going to be no question about it. We're going to be able to point to that thing and say, "This is God." When it comes in your dorm room, you'll be able to point at it and say, "That's God." When you're driving in your car and the Holy Ghost comes on you and the hair stands up on the back of your neck, you're going to be able to say, "That was God." And he's going to give it to the people that are mature in his word. We were in a roundtables meeting today. And they were talking about the different seasons of Cleveland. They were talking about the different seasons that have come and gone. And they said that Michael Obi, I, I don't know. Is there somebody here from Michael Obi's church? Where's David at? You're from Michael, Pastor Michael Obi's church. And they meet in this facility. And they were talking about how he was talking about seasons. Different seasons that come and go. And if you don't know who Pastor Obi is, he's a man of God. He's a man of prayer. 
He's a prophet for this city and for the nations of the world. Just because he doesn't have a TV program, that's not what qualifies prophets. Prayer is what qualifies prophets. Hearing the voice of God is what qualifies prophets. He's a man of God. Oh, my God. Holy Ghost, help me tell the rest of this. Talking about the different seasons that we've come and gone in. And they have been talking about that Friday, this Friday. Right? Am I telling this right? This Friday starts a new season. I don't know if you felt it or not, but there's an urgency. And, I, and I've been telling, uh, we've, we've felt it in our leadership meetings. We've felt it in times of prayer. There's, there's something on, on the inside of me. And, and what kills me is I feel like Noah. And I'm about to tell you the rest of this. They said that we're going into another season. And Pastor Obi, I don't know, maybe you can confirm this, but he's been talking about Noah. And Noah had a hundred years. But God says we've got a hundred days. Watch this. I'm just telling you what, what the men and women of God are saying in this city. That there's a new season that comes. It starts Friday. And Friday is a hundred days to the, to the um, Pentecost Sunday. Which is the global day of prayer. We're stepping into a hundred days. And a and, oh and hundred days. And I'm going to get back to this. I promise. I'm going to get back to this. But in a hundred days... We're going to enter in, and, and, and the word that's been spoken is that after that hundred days, God's going to pour something out on this city, but only those that are in the ark are going to get to participate. And you're not getting in this ark just because you've seen angels. You're going to get in this ark when you know His word. And we're calling out things. We're calling out on things to happen. We're asking God to do all these crazy things, but some of us need to get back just to hear. Just to hear. Don't ask for angels to show up in your bedroom. Ask for you to have your eyes open to the understanding of the Word. Don't ask that you can see angels. What will that benefit you? I don't know who I'm talking to. But don't be asking for some flaky manifestation if it doesn't line up with the Word of God. We're not here seeking for experience. We're seeking for heart change. Well, I'm glad four people are excited about a heart change. I'm telling you, I want to be a part of real revival. I don't want to be a part of the revival. They say, oh, they did well for so long, but what happened? I don't want to be a part of that revival. The revival I want is the one that starts and doesn't end until he comes back. That's the revival I want to be a part of. The revival I want to be a part of is to be able to raise somebody from the dead and still know God intimately. I want to move in miracles, but I want His presence before I ever participate in a miracle ministry. I was talking to Brian Beasley today. And I, let me, before I go into that, let me just tell you, I believe that prophetic word about 100 days. And if there's a time, I believe God's going to put a grace on us for us to get in that ark. And that ark's an established relationship with the Lord. And when that 100 days is over, I'm here to tell you, you're going to go into a season where you're going to be able to experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and you're going to be ready to receive it. But I was talking to Brian Beasley today. He always calls me at some of the... Craziest time. It's like the same time he calls me every Tuesday between the hours of three to four when I'm in a certain when I'm in a certain state of mind and I'm looking for confirmation. He'll call me. It's the weirdest thing. It's a God thing. It's the weirdest thing. Because Brian don't call nobody. He doesn't return phone calls or nothing. So if he calls, brother, you just you pick up because that's the only chance you've got. And he told me and he started ministering to me, man. He said, you know what? He said, we got to raise up a people that are more hungry for His presence than they are for miracles. And he told me, he said, you know what, Mark? And I totally agree. He said, I will trade raising the dead if He'll give me His presence the rest of my life. Because we've settled for ministry instead of the true glory. And ministry's been the Lord over our lives instead of Jesus being the Lord over our lives. And I'm here to tell you, we're not raising that up in this ministry. You can forget it. We're going to raise up people that are going to be intimate with God. We're going to raise up people that know how to pray and know the Word of God. And if none of you see angels, so what? And if none of you do miracles, so what? We're going to see souls saved. And that's the biggest miracle that could ever happen. We got kids going to hell and we want to shout about another believer getting healed. We want to shout about what God's doing in our clique. 
Why don't you drive over on the other side of Bradley where that girl just found out she's pregnant and their family doesn't want anything to do with her. Now let's talk about revival. We're not raising up any more flaky Christians that are concerned about manifestations and experiences. We're going to raise up a people that's hungry for God Almighty. We're going to raise up a people that's hungry for the Word of God and somebody that's hungry for prayer. And if there's no miracles, then we can at least stand like John the Baptist and say, He was the greatest of all the prophets. Why? Because He knew His God. They that know their God will be strong and do great exploits. The reason why we haven't seen great exploits in this city is we don't know God. These men were His believers for three and a half years and now they're in a place of unbelief. Why? Because they didn't really know Him. They trusted in the physical and didn't look for the Word and the spiritual. My God, because His Word is spirit and it's life. He said, you don't believe the words that the prophet spoke. Now watch this. Let me prove to you that, that the Word is the answer. They were walking down the road he began with Moses all the way through to Malachi. I don't know what scriptures he used, but I could just imagine. How many, how many have you ever been in a good meeting where somebody really threw down and preached a strong word and you're like, Woo! I mean, if you had a jacket or a handkerchief, man, you were flinging that sucker around. I grew up in West Virginia, and there was only like four white people in our church, and I mean, they just went for it. And if you didn't shout, you got trampled on. All right? That's the church I grew up in. And I've been in those services, and I can just imagine Jesus, the Son of God, preaching His own self. He didn't need no Hammond. He didn't need a loud PA. He was preaching Himself. And the Bible says in verse 32, after He revealed Himself to them and disappeared, He said, did not our hearts burn within us? Mm. Did not our hearts burn did not, did, didn't we just about blow up when he was talking to us about the scriptures? And some of you have been in service after service and you don't know why you can't shout and you don't know why you can't feel God. It's because your heart is cold. And they said, you know what? Did not our hearts burn within us while he spoke to us and opened up the scriptures to us? I'm here to tell you, I can show you how to change your cold heart. And some of you, it's not even cold. It's just lukewarm. You've gotten complacent. Forget these notes, man. I'm telling you, I'm all over the place. But he revealed himself and he said, and he began to preach. And they said, did not our hearts burn? And some of us are looking, you're waiting for that service to happen that's just going to mess you up and make you on fire for the rest of your life. But I'm here to tell you, it doesn't happen that way. I went to Winterfest every year in my high school career. Drive all the way from West Virginia to Knoxville looking for a fix. I was like a crack addict. Load me up. Load me up. Give me what you got, Jesus. And when it runs out, guess what? I live like hell the rest of the year. I had a parent come to me one time in, in, in our youth ministry. And they said, we took our kid to Winterfest and he went with you guys. And he, he was doing so well for three weeks. And what happened to him? Now he's back living like the devil. He cusses all the time. He disrespects me. He was doing good. I'll tell you what happened. He said, and, and he claimed to have gotten saved on that trip. I said, no, he didn't. Try to tell somebody's mom that their son didn't really get saved. Bless God. You know, and they put on that religious voice. I mean, it all changes. You see the devil come out of them. Lips are, starts going up and everything. You see the signs of a good devil. Come on, some of you know what I'm talking about. You've been in those churches. Mr. Self-Righteous. And I told her, I said, you know what happened? Your kid thought he got saved. He got his emotions stirred. But God still saves people the same way He did when Jesus walked the earth. He said, if any man come after me, he must first, what? Deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. If you haven't denied yourself, you haven't taken up your cross, I question your salvation. Because Christianity requires you to do things that you don't want to do. It requires you to wake up at some point in time in the night. He'll put a burden on you. And the moment you go to sleep, you threw your cross halfway across the room. 
because it's a life of selfless faith. You say, Mark, do you have all that? No, I'm working on it because I'm going to be ready when it comes. I want to get to that place where I'm so moved by the word of God that nobody can shut me up. I want to be able to walk in the church that's so cold, so dark and full of sin, and be a burning and a shining lamp. If it takes going to a desert, that's where we'll go. If it takes us on Tuesday nights saying, you know what, we're not going to have worship anymore. We're going to get our Bibles out and we're going to study this thing from Genesis to Revelation. You better believe that's what we'll do. Because we're going to be ready for when it comes. And I'm not going to raise up a bunch of people that shout and don't know why they're shouting. And I'm not going to let anybody come up in here and call themselves a revivalist and call themselves called to Cleveland and be able to sing about the blood and not have it applied on their lives. It's not going to happen in this ministry. I don't care how many prayer meetings you went to. I want to know what you're doing when you're all alone. I don't care about how many prayer I don't care. You know, listen, I love Greg's prayer meeting, but if the only time I pray is at Greg's prayer meeting, that's not going to cut it. Now, do I believe that you can go to certain events and get yourself stirred and get back? Absolutely. If you're having trouble, and now I'm going to get practical. We've got to get back to the Word. The Bible says that he were, they were walking with Him and talking with Him. That's prayer. Talking with Him. And then He began to expound on the Scriptures. And that was the Word. You have to have consistency in, in the Word and in prayer if we're going to see a true manifestation. I'm going to move this thing so I don't trip over it. We want the real, but we're not willing to get practical. We want experience. We want lights and camera and action. And we, we, want, we want all these things. We want IHOP, but you don't know what price they paid. You say, well, I go down to the ramp, and I go down there, and they jump, and they scream, and they do all You don't know what price they paid. They've been at this thing for 10 years. Both of them started the same year in 1999. They paid a price. You just don't walk into a room like that and start shouting for no reason. There had to be a price paid. And that's why God put you in this city. Because somebody in this city has got to pay the price. We can't settle for shouting. That's why we've missed it. Because we've shouted so much we missed it. But God said if you'll get practical... I'll pour my spirit out. I'm telling you, it's practical, man. It's not difficult. And watch what this, watch this. They get a burning heart, and then one burning heart, two burning hearts, and they run, and they bring the fire to the disciples. That's why I've always said, don't look for revival at convocation. Look at it at the road of Emmaus. It could be two walking down the street, reasoning, communing, talking together. Man, I wish revival would come. I wish revival would come and talk about the bygone days and talk about that prayer meeting, that prayer meeting, and the whole time the Holy Spirit's walking with you. All right? Keep talking. Let's get to the real heart of the issue. And then all of a sudden, these two men that have been walking with God in prayer and in the Word, one day they get a burning heart. And a burning heart, guess what? Turns into a corporate burning. Revival at Lee is not going to start at convocation in some big service. It's going to happen with just two or three. Or it could start with one burning heart. You know what's crazy? I'm crazy enough to believe that the, the people that I'm talking about that you could start with are in this room right now. And you know what it takes? It doesn't take 40 days of fasting and prayer. It takes consistency daily in the Word and prayer. I, I love to study revivalists. And George Whitfield, the first great awakening, he didn't get what he got because he was some charismatic leader. He didn't participate in the great awakening because he was some some crazy Pentecostal. 
He got it because he believed the God of the Word and he believed the Word so much so that he gave his life to the Word and to prayer. And guess what? One day, just an average service, God showed up. And now we know it as the first great awakening. David Hogan. How many's ever heard of David Hogan? In Mexico. Crazy man of God. Crazy looking fella. I mean, seriously, if he walked in this room, some of you'd be like, I mean, he, he's a wild, wild looking guy. And he says, you know what? It's crazy. Start off with just a handful of people, them seeking God. Prayer meetings. The Word. And then he said, one day, I just keep on remaining faithful, just doing what God told me to do, just walking. And he said, then I looked back, and I realized my ministry had now reached to 100,000 people. Just started like this. You know that song I'm thinking about that just put one foot in front of the other. I'm not going to sing. That's Jungle Book, isn't it? Is that right? What is that? What is that? You just put one foot in front of the other and soon you'll be walking through the door. What is that? Huh? Christmas cartoon? That is right. It's Christmas cartoon. Okay. Okay, good. I'm back in, the, I'm back in it now. All right. But I mean, it's just simple. You just walk. Man, I, I look at the whole leadership team. They're like, uh, I don't know. Thanks for helping me out. Um, so much for moral support. Um, but anyways, no, seriously. But I mean, I just thought about that song because it's simple. You take one step. That's, all, that's how he described it. He was just taking the steps, reading the Word, prayer, reading the Word and prayer, and fellowship and communion. And he's just reading the Word. They were getting saturated in the Word and prayer. And then the Spirit started visiting And he said, one day, I just look back and I go, oh my Lord, 100,000 people in this ministry. And we're waiting for this thing to blow up because somebody's going to get visited by an angel. Or somebody's going to... One day you're just going to wake up and you're going to wipe out Lee University by the swat of your hand. Woof! And the Holy Ghost just fall on that campus. No, it starts with this. The Word, prayer. Man, God. Evan Roberts. Welsh Revival. It all started when he came to this preacher and he said, I'm hungry for God. What do I need to do? What do I need to do to participate? What do I, what do I need to do? And he said, he said, they have prayer meetings. He gave himself to prayer meetings every day. Every day. Gave himself to prayer. He didn't miss one prayer meeting for how many years? I forget. I think it was like seven. Seven years. Seven days a week. The man gave him his life to prayer and the study of the Word. And one day, after just walking... Because it was a small thing. Could you? I'm antsy, and we're only in the fourth semester of this thing. And I'm already antsy going, God, send revival. Come on. I mean, come with it. we got to have it now. This man went seven years just taking step after step. That's why God has already taught me that I don't need to look at numbers because one day it's just going to drop. <laughs> you know, at first, when I first started this ministry, we had more people on stage than we did in the audience. I mean, there was 15 honking people on there. And four in the pews. And that was including me and my wife and Mark. Well, no, there was about eight. But still, there was 15 on stage. And just, But it was good times, wasn't it? We got in here and we sought God. And then people, God started adding people. God started bringing people here on Tuesday nights. Not so we could have a crowd. Because he wanted to get the right people to raise up a revival, to raise up some revivalists that can sustain this thing when it comes. That's all he's looking for. He's not looking for thousands in this city. He's just looking for a few. I get up here every Tuesday night. We get up here every Tuesday night and we pour our guts out. Why? Because we believe in this thing. I'm not having service because I need another service. I participate in too much of those things. But I believe in this thing. And we're going to change things. And we're just going to walk. We're just going to keep walking. We're going to get established in the Word and in prayer. And we're going to keep walking this thing through. And then one day we're going to look back and we're going to go, Oh my God, what happened? And be walking with burning hearts. You're not going to struggle with the things you used to struggle with because you've got a burning heart. 
You're not going to have to try to shake yourself to get up for Thursday 6 a.m. prayer anymore because you're going to have a burning heart. A burning heart will get you up 6 o'clock in the morning. A burning heart will get you to service when you don't feel like it on Tuesday nights. A burning heart will cause you to pray for somebody when you need prayer yourself. A burning heart will cause you to start doing missions. I've seen people get radically saved and the fire of God get on their life. And before you know it, they're in another country. I've seen it happen. And some of us feel like we're stuck. And you say, I've been going to services. I've been doing this and that. And God said, it's simple. You don't need to make a bunch of adjustments in your life. You just need to get to know me. We make this thing difficult. You don't have to speak in tongues for 12 hours on a Saturday. And then fast for 40 days to get this. No, it's just one step at a time. The Word and prayer. And then one day, guess what? We're going to walk in this place and we're all going to have burning hearts. And you're not going to have to rely on my anointing to burn. You're not going to have to rely on the worship to burn. You're going to have a burning heart. And when we get in here, we're going to have a good time. And we're going to have testimonies. We're going to hear about souls being saved. We're going to jump and we're going to scream. But the problem is, guys, we're, we're comparing this thing to other cities. We're in a birthing stage right now. And that's why it's so important for us to start. And I'm being very practical, and I want to be. This is not me, but I'm being this because this is the way the Holy Spirit wants it to be. We've got to start now, right here, with the Word and prayer. I challenge you to have daily times of prayer and reading of the Word. And I want you to watch over the course of just a few weeks. I want you to see how, how crazy your life will shift. You'll begin to see things in the Scripture. I know it's 9 o'clock. I'm, I'm not going to apologize because this is what the Holy Ghost wanted to do. And right now, we've been waiting for some crazy service to take place to make a shift in your life. And the Holy Spirit says, I'm making the shift happen right now if you'll just obey this Word. It's going to be like a, it's going to be like a 180, a complete turnaround just because you get these two things right. The Word and prayer. You want to have a burning heart? You've got to get in the Word. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We all know that. And faith is what allows you to have access to God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You can't touch Him without faith. You can't understand Him. You can't perceive Him without faith. You can't receive anything, listen to me, from God without faith. Because the Bible says anything apart from faith is sin. We've got to check ourselves. You know, the greatest sin in our life sometimes is not the things that you think it is. It's where you doubt God's Word in your personal life. That is the worst kind of sin. Stand on your feet. Worship team, uh, if you don't mind, Jessica and all of you get up here because I really feel like the Holy Ghost is going to pour out His Spirit. Some of you in here, you need that shift to take place. And it starts when you get a burning heart. It starts when you make a decision on the inside that I'm going to follow Him. I'm going to take up my cross. I'm going to deny myself. Take up my cross and follow Him. Not doing Christianity. Keep your eyes up here. You've seen people walk around and get instruments on. You've seen people play music. You focus on what God's saying right now. You want, you've got to have a burning heart to participate in what God's going to do. And you've got to make that decision tonight. I cannot make this decision for you. I can get up here and I can preach till I'm blue in the face. But unless you make a decision in your heart, we're not going anywhere. But I just feel the Holy Spirit saying, tonight I'm shifting things. And if you'll partner and go with me, we're going to see God do and what He promised for this city. Just the Word of God and prayer. It's simple, Mark. It's not. It, you don't have to be super anointed to receive something from God. You just got to have faith. You got to have consistency in the Word and prayer. And some of you have been disappointed over and over again with relationships, with finances, with different situations and circumstances. And you're looking for answers and you're saying, I'm trying to adjust this and I'm trying to adjust that. Maybe I shouldn't have hung out with that person. Maybe I shouldn't have done this and maybe I shouldn't have made that decision. And God said, no, 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 it's not that difficult. Just get in my word. Just begin to pray. And I'll 
I'll change things. I'll move for you. Because and, and guess what? You don't have to have big bubbled up faith where you can just start. You just walk in a hospital one day and just start cleaning out things. You don't have to have that kind of faith. It starts with that decision. God said, if you have faith, the grain of a mustard seed. You ever seen a mustard seed? It's the tiniest seed. God said, if you have that, please come down a little bit. He said, if you just have that small, small, small seed of faith, just a little bit. If I can, just give me something to work with. Guess what? Your faith can be increased just by one scripture. I mean, have you, has anybody ever done the lucky dip? Where you just flip it open and like, pow, and you're like, woo! And I mean, you just feel it. I mean, you've, it's called, I call it the lucky dip. You just open it up and boom, there's something that talks to you. Now listen, I don't recommend that all the time. Sometimes it doesn't work. But I mean, I believe God's done that to me to build my faith. I mean, it's just like you go, wham, boom, woo! I mean, I mean, it's on you because you're like, that's, that's for me. And that scripture comes alive. And now all of a sudden God has something to work with. Could it be that the reason why we're not seeing God do what, he's, what He wants to do is because He has nothing to work with. That's why I'm telling you to get into the Word, get into prayer, and that'll give you something for God to work with. When we go to rain, Greg, we're not going there just to listen to worship. We're going there on a word. We're going there to pray because we got a word from God. We're going to rain, not so we can jump around and shout, although that's going to happen. And the glory's going to fill that place. But we're going to go because we got a word. God's going to pour His Spirit out on that campus. That's why we're going. We're going because there is a prophetic destiny for that college. And we're going to go and shift that thing because we got a word. That's why we're here in Cleveland. Because there's a word spoken over this city. And we're going to keep being consistent in prayer and in the word. And we're going to keep going after this thing. And guess what? We're here because we got a word. And we're going to give him something to work with. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes back, will he find faith on the earth? He's looking for faith. But you don't get faith outside of prayer and the word. I want to pray for those of you tonight. I want to lay my hands. Jason, if you get up here, Greg and Mark, leadership. I'm going to lay my hands on anybody in this place. Now, if you've got, if you need healing, by all means, get up here. Well, I want to pray because I can believe God to heal your body. I, I believe it. If you want prayer for your body, get up here. I'll pray for you. But I want to pray for those that say, Mark, tonight, I want to make that decision because I've got to release this. I'm telling you, my heart's on fire like it's never been before. There's an urgency release, and I've got to get it into you. I've got to get it into you. We're at the verge of this thing. We're days from this thing. At any moment, this thing could break open and change our lives for the rest of our lives. Oh, man, this is good. I just heard this. <laughs> Prayer in the Word is what makes you known in heaven. I want to be known in heaven. I want to be known in heaven. Because when I'm known in heaven, He'll move on the earth. Because the eyes, it's back to the heart. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth. I say it all the time. They roam to and fro throughout the earth to show Himself strong and whose hearts are perfected towards Him. We got to get burning hearts. Oh, come on. We got to have burning hearts. We got to have burning hearts. Our heart cries out to the living God. We've got to have burning hearts. Hearts that burn. Hearts that say, you know what? It's 6 a.m. in the morning. I'm going to go and I'm going to pray. Hearts that say, you know what, on Tuesday night, I know i got a bunch of stuff to do, but I'm going to make time to go and get with a corporate body, and we're going to go after this thing. I'm going to make time. I'm going to make sacrifices. I'm going to deny myself and take up my cross. I'm going to fast when I want a Big Mac. I'm going to fast when I want some ice cream. I'm going to fast when I have all these desires. I've got a burning heart, and nothing's going to stop what God wants to do in my life. If that's you, I want you to get out of your seat, and I want you to get up here. You say, Mark, i got to have a burning heart. I can't go through another semester. I can't just go through the motions another semester. I want a burning heart. I want a burning heart. I want to give my life to prayer. I want to give my life to fasting. When you come up here, you're saying, I'm making a decision that I'm going to serve God. I'm going to give Him my heart. I'm going to burn. I'm going to burn. I'm going to burn like never before. Come on, lift up your hands right now. We're going to burn. We're going to burn this semester. We're going to burn with fervor. We're going to burn. We're going to burn. We're going to pray like we've never prayed. We're going to get into the Word of God. We're going to allow the Scriptures to be illuminated. We're going to get in the Word. We're going to burn like never before. Come on. I'm going to have the leadership flow and go, and you go to who the Holy Ghost is leading you to, and I want you to lay hands on them. 
But we're laying hands on every person in this place. We're going to have burning hearts. Come on, call upon the name of the Lord. Say, I want it. Tell him you want it. Holy Spirit, I want it. I want it like never before. I want a burning heart. I want to know you in your word. I want to know you through prayer. 